Um, so what I'll do is just briefly talk about a few areas where we see questions about risk from clients looking at Iran. And in many respects, um, a point I want to make is that Iran is not fundamentally different from other emer emerging markets that our clients look at. And I say that not in that Iran isn't different and doesn't have its idiosyncrasies, but the kind of steps that multinational companies need to go through and think through are pretty much consistent. And the three main areas that we get questions, the first begins with sanctions risk. And as we've heard from the lawyers that have been presenting yesterday very eloquently, that's essentially a function of the nationality of your company, the people who are working in it, the sector that you're working in, and then finally, who is it in Iran that stands to benefit from the work that you'd be doing there? Now, that is essentially a black and white question. It's a yes or no answer from a legal perspective as to whether you can go, and go ahead and do the business that you're looking at. When you move beyond the pure sanctions risk element and look at two other areas which are interconnected, like political risk and reputational risk, I think there you move into a lot of areas of gray. And as you gather information about the type of business that you might be doing in Iran, you get familiar with the stakeholders that you'll be working with, it ultimately becomes a quite a personal, in some cases, emotional question for you as a business and for you as an individual working in that business about whether you're comfortable taking on the type of reputational and political exposure that Iran can provide. And to go back to an earlier comment, these steps are steps that we see companies go through in m many different countries around the world, but Iran presents some fairly unique challenges. I mean, do you crunch these, num these risks down to actual numbers in the way in, that the EIU has done for geopolitical risk and so on? At times, yes. But when, when you are dealing with issues such as whether you as a multinational company that might work in the United States, do you want to make the decision to go and start working in Iran as well with everything that could happen with the US media, US lobby groups, changes in the US political system? The decision about whether you do that, it's quite difficult to reduce sure. to numbers. Yeah. Yeah, I would think it'd be foolish, actually. Uh, yeah. 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 Ellie. Sure, well, four areas that um, I wanted to look at is from a geopolitical angle, which is what we work at most at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And there are areas that have maybe been touched upon in the last day and a half, but uh, perhaps I can go into them deeper. First of all is that Iran's reemergence uh, economically, particularly with Europe, isn't happening in a vacuum. There's a lot of geopolitical parts moving behind the scenes and more publicly. And I think since the post-2001 uh, invasion of Afghanistan, there's been a lot of uh, regional issues erupting that have actually increased Iran's uh, regional role uh, and made it a more important um, actor for uh, Western countries to engage with on a political scene. And I think the level level at which the uh, political appetite to re-engage re Iran economically is going to be affected a lot by the issues of instability, uh, the rise of non-state actors, the fragmentations, refugee flows that we see coming in from the re region. Secondly, and related to that, um, you know, we heard yesterday in one of the sessions that uh, the UAE, in particular in Saudi Arabia, are very nervous about Iran's reemergence. And really, what Gary said of a hotter, drier Middle East, I think also uh, I see the heat turning up, uh, particularly on the Saudi Arabia and Iranian rivalry. And um, the JCPOA has created a sense of uh, reemergence of these old school rivalries that we're going to see, I think, heating up, particularly in the next year uh, on the platform of Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon also, which is sometimes being neglected, but certainly on the geopolitical scale, a lot is happening in Lebanon that could make that region even more unsta unstable than it is already. And thirdly, and connected to the issue of the Saudi Arabia-Iran, uh, rivalry that's been happening is that while Iran has opened the door for normalization with uh, its European old partners, uh, it has also created some new foes in the region, uh, particularly within the GCC states. And now we don't just have, for example, the ideologues who are dedicated to an anti-Iran stance in Washington, D.C., advocating for anti-Iran economic policies, but we also have um, some states from the GCC doing that. And I think that's creating a, a very delicate balance for both policymakers and a lot of companies who have interests uh, within the wider region and the Middle East to consider those factors. And a fourth issue is really what I see is the most immediate uh, political risk at play uh, for, for the nuclear deal 
going forward in the next year is this issue of, firstly, sanctions that are unrelated to the nuclear program. If you see on the, on the Hill at the moment, there is a wave of sanctions being drafted, particularly in relation to Iran's ballistic missiles program, which haven't really been mentioned during this uh, conference. That is something that companies need to keep an eye on because there is a fear that the same way that Iran was contained economically on the nuclear issue may now shift on the ballistic missiles issue. And there needs to be a um, concerted check on what's happening uh, on the hill on that. And secondly, I think this issue of, uh, we heard yesterday on the ambassador's panel that we both need to be patient for the deal to deliver dividends, but also that time is of essence. And I actually think time is uh, perhaps uh, very, very tight at the moment. Uh, Rouhani is coming up for elections next year, and President Obama in the White House, given the, the, the White House elections, doesn't want to do anything that will be uh, seen as playing um, against the Democrats, as giving more concessions to Iran. Meanwhile, Rouhani needs dividends to be flowing in into Iran. And I actually think that this is a particular area where European policymakers and businesses can play a very critical role in safeguarding the nuclear deal at a time when Rouhani needs to deliver results before his elections, but when essentially Obama is tied um, in the White House. Excellent. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's good that you brought up the, the Saudi-Iran context, very important, especially in Yemen now. And incidentally, Sana'a, I think, could be the first city in the world to literally run out of water. So it's interesting you link back to what Gary was saying. Mustafa. <coughs> yes. I think you know, after January 16, there has been lots of expectation among the Iranian industry and the banks to strengthen the banking relationship with their European counterparts. But we have noticed some kind of reluctance. And first, we thought there are some confusion. The confusion whether the JCPOA is going to work properly and the banks would be immune from working with Iranian partners, Iranian banks, which this confusion was there until at least Mr. Kerry made that speech. And it made it clear that they don't have, Americans, the OFAC doesn't have anything in front of the, the, the European banks and doesn't prevent them entering the market. Then we heard about that, okay, the banks are uh, somehow suspicious about the problems that they might face in the form of the risk of the correspondent banking relationship, which we all, we Iranian banks, banks are aware of that. And I would like to emphasize that according to the local domestic rules and regulations, none of these risks exist, exist in Iran. First of all, since 2008, Central Bank of Iran have been very proactive about the KYC and AML. And these are observed, and there is a financial intelligence unit in Ministry of Finance that all banks should report all suspicious transactions to that FIU. And there are extensive, I don't want, want to go through details of that, but I would be happy to share that with our colleagues in other banks to see the number of circulars and the laws and regulation which has been passed on this issue. So these are all in order. Beside, when we ask about correspondent banking relationship, definitely it could cover a broad scope of you know, services, but to start, with, to start this relationship and trust building, we would like just to concentrate on trade finance activities. What do we mean by trade finance operations? We mean for importation of the goods coming from Europe or any other place to Iran. All Iranian banks are equipped with their own system, checking the sanction list, doing all the due diligence on the applicant, who is the applicant, make sure that they are not on the STN list, checking the goods that are going to be imported, not to be in a dual use. In fact, the underlying goods is completely transparent. The beneficiary is transparent. It's supposedly in Germany, it's either Siemens, Hoechst, Bayer, you know, one of these famous. So there is nothing wrong with them, and they are not going to engage in any kind of money laundering operation. 
Then they issue the letter of credit in accordance with UCP 600, which is, again, according to ICC regulation. And at the end of the day, when the beneficiary of the letter of credit provides sufficient documents in compliance with terms and conditions of the LC that the goods have been shipped, they provide the bill of lading, they provide the inspection certificate, the invoice, so everything is clear. And at the end of the day, they want to debit our account and pay to the European beneficiary. I cannot understand what kind of risk is associated with this operation, unless there are other fears, which has nothing to do with the risk issue, which is out of the context of the banking operation. Yeah. I remember I had a grandma. She used to tell me, Mustafa, if you want to do something, you will do it. But if you don't want to do it, you will bring 1,001 reasons exactly. why you should not do it. <laughs> and this is how the Iranian bankers are feeling nowadays in, te in Tehran. I can really sympathize with that, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think it seems to me one of the problems is that whatever Mr. Kerry may say and whatever the State Department may say or Jared Blank this morning, unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily go across the whole political and governmental structure in the United States, which brings me to Barbara. You're based in Washington, D.C. The floor yeah. is yours. Well, as we know, it's all politics. And uh, the 1,001 <laughs> reasons... Uh, I don't know if there are that many reasons against, uh, against business with Iran, but certainly there are many, and they're, they're outside the parameters of the, the JCPOA. Uh, no news to anyone in this room that the U.S. and Iran have no formal diplomatic relations, have been estranged for 37-some-odd years, and uh, there were groups, certainly, that fought very, very hard to try to prevent the nuclear deal from going through. They failed to do that, and Iran is abiding by the terms of the nuclear agreement, so now they are focusing on, on other issues which are outside. So as Ellie mentioned, the ballistic missile tests, uh, human rights. Uh, Ellie mentioned Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis have been very, very active in lobbying, UAE also in lobbying against an improvement of relations uh, between the United States and Iran. We haven't mentioned another country in the region, and that's Israel. Uh, which, of course, is also uh, very suspicious of Iran as well. And, uh, you know, Iran is not entirely blameless in all of this. Uh, you know, there was a report that Iran wrote death to Israel on the ballistic missiles that it tested recently. I think, frankly, it was apocryphal. I don't believe it was true. But it got huge publicity in Israel. It got huge publicity in the United States. It's been mentioned in our presidential campaign. And as you all know, the Republicans now have their presumptive nominee, Donald Trump, who gave a big speech before AIPAC and was very harsh about Iran. Well, they all gave speeches at AIPAC. Yeah. Hillary Clinton also has been very tough on Iran. And it's going to be, I mean, they're going to compete with each other, frankly, to see who can be the <coughs> toughest against Iran. Uh, in the upcoming uh, presidential campaign. Uh, so I think we have to keep these, these factors in mind. Uh, Iran can do more to, to mitigate the sense of risk by cooling the rhetoric. This is a decision for the political leadership of Iran. Iran is entitled to its independent foreign policy. It's entitled to support the Palestinian cause, but there are different ways in which it can express that support. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is something the leadership in Tehran should take into account. Uh, it will be, remain a big political issue in the United States. It will remain a big issue for people running for Congress. We have our congressional elections as well. Uh, so, you know, I simply put that on the table. Let me say one other thing. Zalmay Halilzad, had a, uh, our former ambassador to Iraq and Afghanistan and the UN, had a very interesting op-ed today. Uh, I think it's on Politico. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how the United States should reach out to Iran and Ayatollah Sistani in Iraq to help stabilize the political situation in Iraq. The Prime Minister of Iraq is hanging by a thread. And if that country you know, completely collapses, the fight against ISIS, we haven't mentioned ISIS, is going to be uh, compromised. Uh, and Z I thought it was very courageous. Zami Halilzad is a, is a Republican. And isn't he advising Trump? He's not advising Trump, but he introduced Trump before yeah. Trump gave his so-called foreign policy yeah. speech the other week. Yeah. And for him to say, 
you know, we must reach out to Iran to try to save Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi in Iraq, I thought was a very courageous statement, especially given all the other controversies swirling uh, around Iran at this time. Henry. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add some thoughts on the US side of this, because my colleagues who work on these issues closely in DC don't actually see the US elections as having too much bearing on the nuclear agreement. Because in essence, what this is to both the White House, State Department, defense and security circles in the US is an arms control agreement from which Iran gets an economic dividend and which allows the US to loosely extract it itself from the Gulf. And the reason why we see some of this more assertive behavior from the Saudis and the Emiratis towards Iran, but towards the region more broadly, is that they realize that the US is asking them to do more with their own foreign policy and not rely on the US to be the executor or guarantor of their foreign policy and security. And so that gives us some faith, and this is a view shared by many of our clients, that irrespective of who wins and takes office in the White House, this nuclear deal will hold, provided Iran keeps fulfilling its commitments under the JCPOA. And I think most people you talk to who follow Iranian politics are fairly firm of the view that the stars are aligned in Iran at the moment that the nuclear deal will hold there. Where we see questions from clients which are more concerning from a political risk point of view is the Saudis and the Emiratis, what next? What could be an escalation move for them to take against the Iranians? And the Saudis have clearly said that trade will be one area which they'll focus on. There was a very underreported announcement the other day that Kuwait had said that it had, under the request of the Saudi customs authorities, will stop the re-export of Iranian goods into Saudi Arabia. Yeah. A little gesture, but you know, important, quite yeah. an important one. Let me take some questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, we need the microphone here, right at the front, please. Thank you. Um, Iran is an autonomous, sovereign, and an eternal nation. Not the only, but another eternal nation. Uh, given all that, and given the primary sanctions persist despite uh, mid-January and uh, uh, the agreement that was reached, how much uh, do the underlying reasons for these continuing sanctions have to do with Iran's geostrategic relationships and imperatives vis-a-vis -vis its Eurasian and Far Eastern partners? Again, the autonomy with regard to determining its, its energy interests and its geostrategic interests. It's, it's very easy to just fall back on, you know, its, its, its rhetoric with regard to its uh, rallies or what they put on missiles. But how much is this about things that are very difficult to address, let alone solve, overtly, and hence why, uh, you know, business is being prevented from proceeding vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Washington's policies. Ellie, this is sort of the great game revisited. Sure, well, I think the perception that I found in Iran, certainly since implementation, is even within the middle class political elite um, that are well aware of the misgivings within their own leaderships, et cetera, is a concerning growing sense that Iran's economic isolation is going to continue from a policy from Washington, D.C., uh, because of a number of issues that go back to the historic enmity between the two countries and the sheer volume of lobby groups that are opposing an economic opening with Although Iran. Although the historic enmity only goes back to 79. Of course, And I mean, yeah. this question raises about the eternal thing, so... Sure. <laughs> Sure, but I think also there is there is a understanding and uh, a long understanding that uh, Iran cannot and should not only look to the West for partnerships. There is a yesterday we talked about the North South corridor and that will have huge implications for Iran, and it is uh, it has the support from the highest level of leadership to fully expand relations with China, with India, with Pakistan, with Russia, um, who have all of those actors have taken a very middle position when it comes to issues like the Saudi-Iran rivalry. They haven't, like the US 
uh, or some European member states sided uh, in favour of one side. So I think there's going to be, um, if there is a, a slow movement of uh, dividends coming into Iran from the Western partnerships, particularly Europe, I think we'll see an increasing shift to, to the East and Central Asia from Iran, and perhaps that's the best way for Iran to hedge its bets at the moment. Okay. Uh, question here at the front. Good afternoon. My name is Joachim von Hallas from Reconnect Iran. Question for Mr. Behesh Yurui. Um, we talked about the risks uh, for Iran and possibly for Bank Pazagard. Do you see opportunities for Bank Pazagard in Iran and outside Iran, global opportunities? Yes, indeed. You know, in fact, Bank Pazagard vision has been to be listed in the Fortune 500 companies since the inception of the bank. But we knew it is not going to happen with just domestic banking. We should be a global bank. And in order to do that, we have tried to observe all the international standards and regulations in our bank in order to be able, when the time comes after the JCPOA implementation, then when the door are going to be open, we also have to be compliant with all these regulations, which we have tried our best. We have certain systems in place, the softwares and all the controls, the compliance issues, the risk management issues, internal audit issues, all are in place. And we would be more than happy that our colleagues in European banks come and check our system. Or when we are going to apply for having our international network, either in Switzerland, in Europe, in some other places, definitely we have to observe the regulations. And for this season, we have prepared ourselves, and we are in a position that we think we can comply with all these regulations and then have our presence and move one step forward for the ambition that we have had when we established Bank Pasargat. Uh, Mustafa, I, I, I get the impression throughout the conference that Iranians, with some justification, feel that they haven't been, haven't reaped the benefits yet of the JCPOA. That's correct. Now, Henry, uh, I think your, your view is that the JCPOA is here to stay in the process, regardless of what happens in the US. What about what happens in Iran? Do you think the JCPOA is here to stay? Uh, see, uh, we, th we thought, first we were of the opinion that after the JCPOA, we will see the benefits out of that. Yeah. We have been, you know, we have, uh, we, we have established new relationship, but not with tier one banks. But for the kind of transaction that we would like to handle, small banks you cannot, from the risk point sure. of view, even our own correspondent banking relationship and the risk management that we have, how can I put a limit but of But my question is, will there be a backlash in Iran at some point because you're not getting the benefits you had expected? I wouldn't call it backlash, but it is frustration. <laughs> Ellie. So, look, the deal was a two-way bargain, yeah. and it's fair enough for uh, representatives from the E3 plus 3 to say, we've fulfilled our part and removed sanctions, but I think every expert and every negotiator who worked on the deal knew the intentions behind lifting sanctions was to have economic flow. Yeah. That was the end of the bargain for Iran. Now, it comes back to my qu uh, point about time is of the essence for Iran. You've already seen Iran starting its uh, presidential campaign uh, rhetoric from the Rouhani's op opposition, they are going to attack him at the core of his campaign pledge, which was the economy. And Iranian po politics is not predictable, so I wouldn't put it past, you know, a lot of people in the West say there will be no return of the Ahmadinejad-esque. But they, they have their constituencies and they have their support. And if they can attack Rouhani on the one issue that he pledged on, yeah. uh, which is this economic flow, don't expect everything to be predictable come 2017. Excellent. Yes, Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. For ordinary people, it's frustration. But for those who are in the politics, in fact, they are trying to use it as a kind of, you know, yeah. uh, against, you know, the policies which has been, you know, followed by Mr. Rouhani and his colleagues in his cabinet. Henry. I think one of the consistent themes from the past two days has been 
the banking isn't working and the banking needs to work for the economic dividend to reach Iran. If it doesn't reach Iran, then what happens? Does the deal just collapse? Or do we try and find workarounds that allow the banking to happen and save the deal? And speaking to people in the margins of the conference over the past two days, hearing some of the presentations, it doesn't sound like anyone has any particularly good ideas as to how this banking issue is to be overcome. Mm. So if we're still here in six months' time and the banking, banking issues haven't been resolved, then you, know, you could be looking at a more negative prognosis be for the reasons that Ellie's described. Control risks, though. We, we like countries that are open for business. <laughs> yeah. uh, gentleman there, and then gentleman there. One, two, three. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Would it be fair to assume a year or two from now we're in the same place as we are today? Because based yeah. on what I've heard in this forum, these obstacles are not going to be lifted if we're fighting over rhetorics. Thank and you very much. Let's hold that thought and send the microphone down here. Thank you. I'm a banker, but my question is answered to the political panelists. Uh, we have all seen how Iran is fighting Daesh. Daesh was mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know who's buying the Daesh oil. We all know who's financing Daesh. And the remark that I have is that I believe today the truth is falling victim to rhetoric, maybe uh, vote chasing, uh, and also some particular interest by some certain countries. <laughs> Isn't your organizations, uh, there have been documents on who's buying the Daesh oil, there have been documents who've been financing Daesh, and there's also evidence that Iran is fighting Daesh on the ground. Mm -hmm. Isn't organizations like, like yours responsible to bring out the truth mm -hmm. and tell to the public uh, yeah. what really is the situation and what really Iran is doing and who is the enemy? Okay, hold that thought for a second. Yeah. Yeah. John? There was, a third, there was a third question. We'll come back, back to a third question as well. Third, yes. I, th I think after JCPOA, we are here, we gathered for talking about business opportunities. Unfortunately, yesterday and today, I think uh, more of our discussion after uh, lifting the sanction and uh, the nuclear issues changed to human rights, to other issues, to missiles, and we don't know when this talking will be finished. <laughs> because, uh, because I know that... Uh, in the past, we have the relationship with the European countries before uh, the nuclear issues raised. And now I don't know what happened that after lifting the sanctions, we're continuing about the new items and we should uh, speak instead of talking about the business relationship, about the, some confusing issues that I think change the environment of the business environment. Uh, in fact, in the past, uh, during our war with uh, Iraq, we had a relationship with European countries, and now everybody, everybody knows about the uh, decision of Iran, why we approach to the missiles for our defense. Uh, the real issue that raised for the, in the, uh, as an idea for everybody that we talked in networking times that it seems another uh, subject that uh, we don't know uh, what's the main of this subject uh, that uh, affect all of the business transaction of Iran with the foreign, uh, foreign countries, especially European. I, I want to know what is this main subject okay. that we cannot talk about this, but uh, just talk about the other uh, okay. similar issues. Shahab, thank, thank you very much. So we had three things there. Barbara, you've got a trio to answer now. All right, well, I, I think, first of all, uh, I understand your frustration, and, and what I was asked to do, I was a late addition to this panel, was to explain to all of you what the environment is like in the United States. For those of you who don't live in Washington, 
who don't live and breathe what they say on Capitol Hill, what they say in debates between the presidential candidates. So I'm not saying this is just or this is right. I'm just saying it's what it is. And I also wanted to take the occasion to explain, because I, a lot of people have come up to me and asked, what is a think tank? And what is your think tank? And there's a lot of suspicion about think tanks in Iran. So I want to explain what the Atlantic Council is. It's a very old think tank. It's been around for something like 60 or 70 years. It's expanded in recent years to cover more than the US-Europe uh, relationship to cover uh, issues all around the globe. I've been working on an Iran program for five years. My mission is to explain Iran to the Washington policy elite, which is woefully ignorant about the reality of Iran and Iranians. And I've had the good fortune to go to Iran nine times over the last 20 years. I hope, inshallah, I will get another visa to go again. <laughs> and I explain the full reality of Iran. And that means the level of education, the sophistication of the people, the hospitality of the country, uh, many, many aspects that are almost never discussed in a Washington context, where all we hear is death to America, death to Israel, missiles, human rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to build a bipartisan consensus in Washington around pragmatic policies that are in US national interests. That is the role of the Atlantic Council. We were very active before the JCPOA in explaining it to a bipartisan Republican and Democrat Washington policy elite. We brought Iranians to speak to some of these people and explain from an Iranian point of view as well as American officials. So that is our role. We analyze, we hold panels like this one, and I, you know, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. It's not easy in, Iran, in, in Washington to present the reality of the country in all its aspects, oh, but, but we do our best. Let me stop you there, because the gentleman at the front, um, I thought asked a very interesting question. He didn't name certain countries, but any, perhaps you would. I mean, talking about Dalit Islam, if you like, for Sham and Daesh, um, what do you think? Sure, let me, quickly before I come to that question, but the issues that Barbara is talking about is completely the same in Europe. I travel across Europe talking to European policymakers whose one of their key tools in foreign policy is the economy. And they're not going to look at Iran just through the economic lens. They have a multiple range of portfolios that they try and balance at the same time. And the geopolitical issues, and particularly for Europeans, what's happening on Congress uh, in terms of primary sanctions is going to influence how their decisions are shaped. And their longest terms allies in the region, such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, are also going to have a big stake in how those are shaped. So it's really important for businesses both in Iran and Europe to understand how those policies from the top are going to trickle down. And yes, in the last two years, you can see particularly in Europe, and I think also in the debates in the US, you've seen a shift in the discussions about how traditional actors who were being uh, seen as uh, the stability, the stabilizers of the region, such as Saudi Arabia, even Turkey, are now being questioned as whether they are the longest term allies and whether there needs to be a more neutral stance on the main regional powerhouses in those regions. Now, Iran can either use that as an opportunity to open up certain doors or it can uh, continue towards the same rhetoric that has closed doors before. So it's an opportunity on both sides. Okay. I'm going to take one more question. Um, and I think with all respect there, you were the first. Okay, my question address, uh, Ms. Barbara. Uh, I wasn't here you know, from the beginning of the panel, but I'm sorry I couldn't make it. But my question is that um, uh, uh, the presidential campaign in uh, Indiana was uh, over, and Mr. Uh, what do you call it? Trump. 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 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Donald. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he won the primary presidential campaign, and he's now nominated, you know, by the Republican as well. The not yet, but soon. Yeah. Well, he will be. Okay. <laughs> let's assume that uh, the presumptive nominee. Yeah. Let's yeah. assume that he gets over, and uh, beat the other, let's say, Democratic, uh, whoever is this going to be, uh, 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 presidential campaign uh, uh, race. 
And he becomes uh, the president. And if he promised, uh, if, you, if you take his promises during the presidential race, that he will tear down no, the JCPOA. He didn't say that, actually. Well, he said he, that. He, he said he would police he the let hell finish, out of let it. Let me finish the question, please. Sure. OK. But uh, as what would as be, What would be the consequences? Sure. OK. OK? And uh, sure. of course, the Americans uh, are uh, the one partner of the five plus one. Yeah. I don't know what the, uh, let's say, position of the European five would be in that, uh, in that regard if that happens. But what is going to be the real consequences after Trump gets to the, let's say, office, and then he ignores, you know, what the promises, you know, or, or what the signature was the, uh, about the JCPOA by the Americans? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Barbara, well, sure. first of all, we have a long way to go, and the polls show that Hillary Clinton is, would be way ahead of Donald Trump. Uh, in, in an election. However, Donald Trump has not said he would tear up the JCPOA. That was Ted Cruz who withdrew from the race uh, yesterday. Uh, I, don't th I agree with Henry. I don't think uh, any U.S. president will tear up or, or try. To, uh, it's an international agreement. It's blessed by the U.N. Security Council. Uh, an American president cannot walk away from it uh, unless Iran violates it in some material way. So that, that's, that's not my concern. The concern is about the broader U.S. foreign policy and the shape of it. And uh, uh, frankly, I don't know what Donald Trump would do. I don't think Donald Trump knows what he would yeah. do <laughs> if he were elected president. He has no particular track record. He's been all over the map on foreign policy. He's, he said he was against the war in Iraq, but then he was for the war in Iraq, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that we should concentrate on full implementation on both sides and, uh, and, and not worry about the U.S. presidential campaign. Thank you very much. I think, sadly, we have to leave. Perhaps <laughs> but, I mean, as is always inevitable, it seems, with Donald Trump, he sort of gets publicity. No matter what. Lot, no matter what. <laughs> um, thank you very, very much for a lovely panel, extremely good. And thank you, audience.